Oh, my name is Dakajawea. And <clears throat> in the Mohawk language, that means split in the sky. Well, welcome. Welcome to Mole Medicine. And uh, I have to let folks know before we say anything that uh, the following commentary, if there is commentary, that does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of KAOS, the Evergreen State College, or the underwriters of KAOS. If you'd like to express another opinion, you can do so by calling 867-6897 during weekday business hours. Now that I said that, we can just about say whatever we want, but we cannot say any four-letter nasty words or anything, so no delay. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, You you mentioned you're from Mohawk country. Um, Tell me what life was like growing up out there for you. Well, my my family comes from uh, Oshawa Mohawk territory in Ontario, Brantford, Ontario, originally. Uh, My mother moved and married, moved to Buffalo, New York, in the States and sought residence in the U.S. and um, married my father there and then I was born in Buffalo, New York along with all my brothers and sisters in the early 1950s. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, um, you know, at that time, um, things were pretty dark times for Native people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I say real dark times because it was sort of the the end of the conflict eras, wars between U.S. domestic aggression against indigenous peoples and mm-hmm. and the war societies that fought valiantly trying to preserve a way of life. And uh, in my way, I'm from the Ganyange Hoga, which is the, you know, it's as Mohawk people, and it's a part of the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy. Mm-hmm. And... Um, those are pretty dark damn times for Native people then because uh, there was, it was a lot of treaty making that went on basically at the point of a gun. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of concessions like where I come from. There was uh, millions of acres of land that was confiscated by the Ogden Land Company and, and it was backed by the, the New York State militia. It was backed by the, <laughs> the federal forces. In the same vein that uh, that the federal government and the Calvary seized uh, the lands of the Oglala Sioux, Nakota, Dakota, under the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, on uh, the same way they took it from the <coughs> the uh, Nusawamwe people, the in uh, the Treaty of Ruby Ruby Valley. Mm-hmm. And violated, you know, after 1871, basically violated, just, just basically wrote our genocide into existence by writing away all of our land mm-hmm. and the whole uh, question of title to the land. Uh, and the uh, 1871 uh, General Allotment Act, which basically Congress basically passed a law saying that all lands belong to the, the U.S. government and Indian lands would be allocated by acres to families and there'd be an allotments of lands and all the surplus lands would then be turned over to uh, white homesteaders and large tras- tracts of the most fertile lands were given to white homesteaders. Mm-hmm. And so basically what we had, when I talk about coming through the dark times, we're talking about coming through the, the era where the U.S. foreign governments and uh, their standing armies basically succeeding in colonizing indigenous peoples at the expense of, well, close to 80 million Indian peoples in a matter mm-hmm. of 513 years. And so there's that whole very, very long story. <laughs> yes, and, yes. and where I come in, uh, and after part of the story is in the early 1952 is when I was born, 52 years ago. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my story basically started up in the streets, the slums of Buffalo, New York. Mm. And um, at that time, the United States government had another program of assimilation, mm-hmm. which basically stole the Indian kids and took us from our parents and put us into white foster homes and or boarding schools, which was the... Uh, the original residential school concept. Mm-hmm. Even in New York? Even well. in New York, uh-huh. yes. 
Uh, so there was variations, different variations of the residential schools, whether you had the mm-hmm. residential schools in Carlisle, Virginia, right. uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, or you got the, uh, the boarding schools like the Monsignor Kellers in Buffalo, New York, where I was at. Mm-hmm. And basically, but the policy was basically to take Native children from their parents, especially if there was a Native woman who was a single uh, parent they would declare the mother unfit and take the child and then put them into these boarding schools. Um, the horrors and atrocities that happened during the time of confinement was unbelievable. One day they came and snatched me and my sisters up when my mother went out to get some bread mm-hmm. and went to the store up the corner, and uh, they just knocked the doors down in a real police days fashion and just pulled me and my sisters out. Mm-hmm. and uh, put us into different f- homes, and eventually I went to this boarding school. And, uh, and you know, they cut your hair, mm. cut, cut, your, cut your hair all off. They strip you, they bathe you, you know, they shower you, then they spray you with some kind of chemicals, and they issue you a wardrobe for your section in the dormitory. And uh, it was horrible because at that time it was still speaking the language, it was mm-hmm. the Mohawk language. Mm-hmm. But then they had these priests and these nuns and these good people that worked inside these institutions. And if you were caught speaking your language, Indian kids, they would take needles and stick it through our tongues. Wow. Put duct tape around our eyes and our mouth mm-hmm. and handcuff you and duct tape our hands and throw us in a closet for two or three days with no food and just stuck there locked into these closets. Mm. So it was a horrifying psychological uh, uh, terrorism that was perpetuated Mm -hmm, in these institutionalized racist uh, uh, institutions. And it was really designed to terrorize a young child, uh, coupled with the fact that many of these priests and these nuns were sexually abusing and molesting children. Mm. Now, I, I remember in the middle of the night as a child, I remember hearing in the dormitories all these children, you know, being taken from their beds Mm -hmm. and then put into other different rooms and you could hear them screaming because they were being sexually assaulted and screaming for the mom and their dad. Wow. And so it was a horrible situation. Right here in America. Right here in America. Yeah. And and it was a terrible situation. And, And it was designed systemically to terrorize the mind of young Native people, mm-hmm. and to completely take us away from our cultural identity and our roots, and then this way, in the terrorizing and assimilating us with, you know, religious indoctrinations, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Catholicism. In their words, saving you. Yeah, and this was salvation. Right. You see. Mm-hmm. While they're having anal sex with young kids mm-hmm. in these joints. Mm-hmm. They're then saying it's 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 a crime to masturbate mm. in the eye before the eyes of God. Mm. So we saw this hypocritical mm-hmm. terrorism that was being perpetuated by these people that ran these institutions. Mm. But it, the, in the long, the long, um, <clears throat> long and short of it, the uh, the part of their design was is to. Continue to terrorize people by sexually assaulting them and beating them mercilessly. In my case, I, I got beaten and tortured a number of times because I wouldn't go along with the program. Mm-hmm. And uh, the bigger it got, the stronger I got, and the more I fought back. Sure. And so I found myself, literally, to the 27 years, wow. I was locked up in these kinds of institutions, including prisons, mm-hmm. but but for things that were like done in response to trying to just survive these brutal institutions, Mm -hmm. you see. Right. And so... Not for any crime. Not for any crime. Mm -hmm. Never for a crime. My only crime was is that I had been born an Indian. Right. So what was it like to go from that situation and find yourself on the streets of Buffalo, New York? Well, when I... make your way. Well, when I got out, I had absolutely no training. The only Mm -hmm. thing I ever did was milk some cows and work on a farm. Milk cows by hand, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Now, there was, a no, there was no need in Buffalo, New York, for that kind of uh, training. And so I couldn't find any work, and out of complete desperation one day, 
Uh, I was tired of sleeping in the street, and I was trying to keep myself warm by drinking a bottle of Southern Comfort every night mm-hmm. to go to sleep in sub, sub, sub-zero d- uh, degree weather. Eee, it gets cold up there. It gets too. very cold. <laughs> you know Buffalo. It's very <laughs> cold. It's like Canada. Yeah. It's as bad as Canada. So in any event, uh, one night out of desperation, I uh, attempted to stick up a, a, a store. Mm-hmm. And I only had my finger inside of a coat jacket. <laughs> And I tried to convince this woman I had a gun, but she didn't buy it. And she yelled at the top of her lungs, and her brothers come running downstairs, two big Italian guys. Oh, no. <laughs> they pounded on They pounced on me and beat the stuff out of me. And uh, they called police, and police came and arrested me. And they wanted to know before the police got there, well, you know, why I did what I did. I said, well, you know, I said, I'm living in abject poverty, and I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't have no place to stay. Sure, right. So they give me this greasy submarine sandwich after they beat me up, you know, right. and put me in the joint. And before you know it, I went before a court, and uh, I thought I was going to get probation. Right. And that's what the, my court-appointed attorney told me. I'd been in the joint for four months, and they were wearing four me months. down. Yeah, I was down in four months before I went before the but judge. They were, you were thinking time served. Time you know. served. Right. Probation. Right. So when I went before the judge, the judge says, well, you know, Effing savages like you belong behind bars. You're an animal. He said, I'm giving you eight years. Whoa. Eight years for an attempt at robbery. How old nothing. were you? I was 17. Eight years. Eight years. 17 years old. That's eight. right. So I, next thing you know, I found myself behind the bars, and I was heading for a number of different prisons. Mm. Um, while I was in there, I was becoming very politically active and conscience. Mm -hmm. Many people were coming in from the streets of the anti-war movement during Mm -hmm. that time, the anti-Vietnam War movement. So what year are we talking about? We're talking 69, 69. 70. Mm -hmm. Back right about when they were really starting to put people in jail for a lot of that. Mm -hmm. A lot of social activists were going to jail. Mm -hmm. But of course there was a lot of organizations and people of different ethnic persuasions that were really bucking the status quo. Right, and there was a there was a whole revolution going on in this country. Sure, George Jackson, and, and yeah, any figures very prominently in the situation that I was involved in. Mm-hmm. August twenty first, uh, George Jackson had been killed. Right, at San Quentin, I believe it was San Quentin or sold that prison. Yeah, yeah, I think San Quentin. I think right. And uh, they say he tried to escape, and and then they, I guess, they put nineteen bullet holes in him, and they killed him in and the prison yard. George Jackson being a um, an African American or Black revolutionary uh, who wrote a book called Soledad Brother. Yeah, and Blood which, in My Eyes, which was a book he wrote while in prison, mm-hmm. I believe. Uh, and he was arrested originally for seventy dollar robbery. Seventy dollar robbery. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, he wrote a book about well, a lot of Soledad Brothers about what it's like to be of not just a black person in prison, but a person of poverty and color mm-hmm. in prison. And a lot of people connected with it. Just to give some background, if you don't know who he is, yeah. those of you listening. But so you find yourself at Attica somehow. So yeah. Um, I actually, I was uh, sent from uh, Elmira Reformatory <laughs> to Attica State Prison 16 days before the rebellion happened. Now, what happened 16 basically? 16 days. 16 days. <laughs> you had no idea. Did you know, did they know it was coming? Did you? Well, no, and I don't think anybody really knew it was coming, except that there was a lot of militancy that was developing inside of prisons. Mm-hmm. And again, I said there was a, there was a whole reign uh, there was a whole consciousness of uh, prisoners that were becoming politically astute and aware and that weren't accepting the whole regimentation of authority by the New York State penal system. And as a matter of fact, right across the board. But it was a corrupt prison. Yeah. It was very corrupt, uh-huh. and it was a murderous regime. Really? And you see, so at that kept, time, they kept there was everyone in check by murdering people. Is that kind yeah, of that? Uh-huh. pretty much they beat them over the head and kill them right there in front of you in order to keep other rest of the prisoners in check. Right. Were the top to down. terrorize you mentally to watch somebody being beaten to death. And I, I saw seven or eight guys beaten to death right in front of me, bludgeoned to death, mm. and buried in unmarked graves. Wow. So this was the kind of, and, and, and there was hundreds of these kinds of situations sure. that were going unchecked, and many of the prison guards were avowed members of the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazi organizations. And murderers. Murderers. Yeah. Outright killers. Mm-hmm. With racial racial under and a hundred percent of them were all white racist bigots, and we're talking about a 
you know, America hasn't changed a whole lot, but we're talking about a different America. The so. only thing that's changed since that time to today, it was only 750,000 prisoners. Now you've got 2.1 million prisoners in the United States, the land of the free. <laughs> More than any other country in, in the, the world, world. Yeah. including South Africa right. and in Russia. Right. Well, it, let's continue with it. So in Attica, 16 days before you're, you find yourself in Attica, as a, how old were you then? I was uh, 19 years old. 19. Uh-huh. And, uh, were there other native folks in, in There Attica? was about 10 of us all together. Yeah. We were always the minorities. The one minority. percenters. <laughs> the one percenter. In New York prisons, except Auburn State Prison had something like maybe 60, the largest prop, you know, population of native prisoners. Is that a federal or state? Yeah, federal was a lot more. Yeah. Keep but in any event, uh, what happened was, well, we got there, and the conditions were so rancid. And, of course, then there was these beatings and killings that were going on. And there was just a whole wave of people that came into prisons that were from the Black Panther Party, the BLA, mm-hmm. the Puerto Rican Liberation Army, you know, and, and even white revolutionaries were coming in, you know, the anti-war demonstrators, and you had socialists. You had, you had people like... Uh, a uh, guy who became a political mentor of mine by the name of Sam Melville. He was affiliated mm-hmm. with the Weather Underground mm-hmm. and with a group over here, the George Jackson Brigade, mm-hmm. you know, and, and some of those folks are really good friends of mine from up this way, and I'm proud to say that. That's right. Uh, whoever's listening. Uh, whoever's listening. <laughs> and um, and and then these, uh, this situation, so like I said, there was, a, there was a time where people were starting to say, well, you know, later for this uh, repression, later for this terrorism that's happening inside the joints, mm-hmm. um, we started seeing ourselves as prisoners of war and political prisoners as opposed to criminals. Mm-hmm. We saw that the whole structure itself wasn't, wasn't designed to meet in our needs, basically. And mm-hmm. so basically the rich got richer and the poor got poorer and the gulf between the rich and the poor you know, it leads to, uh, uh, leads to the whole question of uh, penal structures. Everyone's a political prisoner. Yeah, everyone's the a political prison. The system is political, and the system is yeah. why people are in jail. Yeah, I mean. So here we are, and, uh, well, the one day there was an incident out in the yard. Now, one thing is they used to come out, like there was a real racist cops that would come out, and mm-hmm. uh, they would take this ice buckets, for instance, and they would throw out in the yard. They would uh, get out there, and they would yell out, white ice. And so all the white prisoners would come over and they'd get their ice, you know, from the bucket in their bags so to cool their drinks off. Yeah, yeah. Then what was left, that what the white prisoners didn't want, they'd take the ice and they'd throw it in the grass and they yell out, black ice. And have all the black guys or all the, you know, the black and Indians and, and, and the Puerto Ricans <laughs> go scramble for what was Any left in the dirt. Yeah, <laughs> dirty ice. So it was that kind of thing. And it was also the kind of rancid meals. It was the, people were living on 62% percent, you know, a day per capita. Mm-hmm. And so in other words, in rancid food, um, there was no representations of the Puerto Rican peoples, no legal, no law libraries, no access to outside lawyers. No Spanish-speaking guards. No Spanish-speaking <laughs> guards. Uh, the, the whole gambit, it was a terrible situation, and people found themselves in. And, 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 and it got to a point where the pressure was becoming over overwhelming and inmates were just basically saying you know what the heck with this and every time the guards start to beat up on somebody the inmates would start fighting back Mm. and so one day there was this uh there was a skirmish between a black guy and a a white guy and they were just uh skirmishing out there for a football game and this uh, lieutenant came out and says well lock that effing nigga up wow and then uh well the brother he says well no no i'm not gonna be locked up, and when they went to grab him, ten goons, he punched one of them in the mouth. He punched the lieutenant in the mouth. Well, at that point, everybody spontaneously, usually everyone was pretty much into their own corners, their own sure. cliques, and nobody would sit, just turn their eyes and they figure, well, this guy punched him in the mouth, he's going to be take him up in the box, they'll beat him half to death, they'll string him up, they'll kill him, and they say he committed suicide. Mm. Well, it just everybody jumped up at the same time. And this was after the George, they killed George Jackson, and we had a big memorial thing for him out in the yard, and we defied the guards' orders to go back to our cells. Mm. All, so all, all this culminated, of- right, and, and, and to kind of showing the guards at that point that we weren't going to tolerate it no more. We were you becoming a unifying force of all races in that prison. Mm. And so we all came together, and we all stuck together, and we, you know, we got past our own, you know, uh, systemic prejudices, mm-hmm. and we tried to unite on a common front to let the enemy class know that we weren't going to take this anymore. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so they locked these two guys up, 
That night there was a big ruckus in the prison uh, cells and people were throwing cans out in glass where they went and got these two and put them in solitary confinement. Mm. Now, the next morning, the word had gotten around in the prison grapevine that these guys had been locked up in violation uh, of the word that they had given not to lock these guys up. Mm. So that morning, when you know, the word went around, to everybody wouldn't take food. So 1,300 men that went into the yard, we wouldn't take food and say nothing, so it was a quiet fast. 1,300 men. 1,300 men. (laughs) Now, the only ones that ate that morning were the diabetics. And you couldn't hear a puke. Whereas you used to hear all the clamoring. Right, it's a big social event, too. It's just an incredible noise. And then all of a sudden, you know, nobody's taking any food, nobody's saying anything, and then there's like three, about a hundred guards along the wall, and you can hear their keys shaking because they're, well, they're afraid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're afraid that something's going going to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, as we're walking down the uh, galleries, and we're walking down the halls to go back to our cells, usually you go out to the yard before you go to a work assignment. By the way, everybody that worked in in the prison industries. The highest paid prisoners during that time got two cents a day. Two cents. Wow. For working in the sweatshops. Oh, gosh. Can you imagine that? Two cents. Six days a week with one shower a week. Wow. In the sweatshop. Yes, Jeez. in sweatshops. But if you got two cents a day, you got a lot of money. Most people didn't get nothing, and right. they still had to work. Jeez. Complete slave labor. Yeah, it's still like that to this day. And it's still like that to this day. And now today you've got it, you've got uh, corporations like Wackenhut right. that are making multi-million dollars in mm-hmm. profits and privatization of all the prisons and mm-hmm. all of these super maximum security prisons throughout the US, United States. And it's become a privatized industry. Mm-hmm. You see, Fortune 500 says that the number one industry in this country is prisons. And that if you want to invest your stocks in a guaranteed winner, invest it in prisons. Financial incentive for arresting more people. That's right. Whether they be political or well, for whatever. And see, a lot of people don't know that Wackenhuck is still the same people, by the way, that that were entrusted with the security agents to get all the biochemical war, for, war agents, mm-hmm. chemicals that were sent from... From Chicago to Texas and back up to Baltimore to be shipped over to Iraq to be used against the Kurds. Mm-hmm. This is the same ones that same run people, yeah. the prisons in this country today. High-tech security. High-tech security forces. Yeah. And I think they've had a cast of evil characters working for them over the years. But Big time. Anyway, so Attica is just this boiling kettle. I mean, boiling kettle. It's waiting all to of explode. A sudden, waiting, it just exploded one that morning. We went out and we were getting ready to go wait for our job assignments and usually go outside and lift some weights or play some chess or smoke some cigarettes and walk the yard until your work assignment. Mm-hmm. Well, all, all the doors that morning were locked. Wow. So they were trying to get everybody back in their cells. And they were going uh-huh. to try to find the guy that threw a can of soup that hit the one guard in the head you know, <laughs> from the from the melee the night before. The night before. Huh? Right. So anyways, uh, when they everybody got there, there's, uh, to the doors, I found them all locked. And this guy comes over, uh, captain comes walking down with uh, some other guards. And there's one brother that was in the Black Panthers. And this other guy, Sam Melville, I was talking about from the uh, Weather Underground. They stopped this captain and asked him what happened. Why, you know, what happened to those two guys? Why were they locked up from the day before that incident? And the other guy that got locked up for the can of soup. Well, we don't know, fellas, which is not the <laughs> typical language, but we'll look into it. And huh. uh, the one brother says, oh, well, the panther says, well, I think you're full of you-know-what, buddy. Punched him right in the mouth. The panther. Knocked him down. Yeah. Sam Melville kicked him in the side, broke his ribs, and that was it. And I turned around and yelled, this is it. Take it to place. <laughs> Yeah. Of then, course, I used a lot of other depletives, <laughs> but this show won't tolerate such language. That's right. You see. <laughs> and justifiably so. I've kind of outgrown all the depletives. Well, yeah. Uh, right? We could say it off the air. But. Yeah. <laughs> if we choose. That's right. If necessary. But in any That's event, yeah. uh, not to take away from the seriousness, uh, we seized the prison. Mm-hmm. And uh, they tried to, guards tried to lock up all four gateways. 
and there was a four quarters came down to central location where there's four major iron gates and the guards that were on the inside those gates had the keys mm -hmm. and you couldn't get to the other three quarters of the buildings of the of the one mile by one mile prison complex without going through these quarters these gates uh -huh. and so I we call that particular central location we call the Times square <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't give up the keys to open it up, so eventually there was like 60 of us in A block pushing and pulling on this cast iron gate, and all of a sudden, we ripped the gate right out of the walls. Wow. Now, in the official McKay Commission report on Attica, they said that the gate had a defective weld. Well, I'm here to tell you <laughs> and any prisoner that might be listening now, <laughs> those gates can pull right out <laughs> of those walls if you have a united front. Yeah. Pulling on it, yanking on it. I like that. So you see, that's the power of unity. Mm -hmm. Ripped it right out of the walls. Couldn't believe it when we ripped it out. It came down. <laughs> and there was a guy that was in there. He was a guard by the name of William Quinn. When that gate went down, it hit him in the head. Two days later, he died. Uh. Well, they tried to say I hit this man in the head with a stick and killed him. Oh, no. Which was not true. But since I'm the one that yelled out, take this depletive uh -huh. place, right? I was the scapegoat. And, of course, Indians. Indian. <laughs> the Indians are the best scapegoats. Yeah. There, was, there was only a couple of us there. That's right. So we first we didn't have no so, social backing. Uh -huh. I didn't have any familiar backing. My uh -huh. family was all gone. So I became a prime scapegoat. But, of course, again, I say, because I said, take this depletive prison, mm -hmm. you know, well, then it was a, I was the perfect scapegoat. Sure. So my case became the number one political trial in this country in 19, early 1970, 73, 74. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you read uh, Mary, uh, Mary uh, 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 Crow, Crow Dog, Mary Crow yeah. Dog's book, uh -huh. original book, her first book, she pretty much uh, says that my case was the case that inspired the American Indian movement mm -hmm. to come together. Mm -hmm. You know, because I totally defied the United States government and said that they basically had no jurisdiction over me. And subsequently, I wouldn't stand for the judge when it came in. I wouldn't recognize they had jurisdiction. Really? And I raised the whole question, the title, you know, at, 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 at a rudimentary age. <laughs> you know, since then, I have become extremely well adversed mm -hmm. in the whole question of title. And if uh, your listening audience is interested, you're going to hear the whole earload in a fiery delivery this weekend. That's right. Uh, on Saturday from 4 to 6 in uh, the uh, LH1 room, Lecture, Lecture Hall, Hall 1. one. It's room. here at, on the Evergreen State College campus for those listening outside of Olympia. And uh, that's in coinc coinciding with the Synergy Conference um, that's going on, I believe, tomorrow through Sunday. Tomorrow through Sunday, yes. Uh, there's some schedules uh, around Evergreen. If you're outside of Evergreen, you could probably... Type into a search engine online synergy conference and find out more. I'm sorry, I don't have more information on me, like a website you could go to. But if I find something, I'll, I'll shout it out later on. Well, I just happen to have something here. Oh, he, he, and you can look at it while I tell you the rest of the story. Yes, that's where it's really great. starting to lose time. And again, I'm just touching and tickling <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, well, go ahead. Uh, what happened basically was is the. Uh, we knocked that gate down, and we liberated the rest of the prison. We seized 50 hostages and held them mm -hmm. for five days. And, uh, and we negotiated a lot of reformist-type uh, demands at that point. But some of us weren't, like, satisfied with making life comfortable in prison mm -hmm. in order to do these ridiculous uh, bids. Like, at that time... There was this, uh, and it still exists today, the Rockefeller drug laws. People right. were going to jail mm -hmm. for life for possession of a joint. There are still some people that I left in prison 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that are still in there doing life bids for possession of less than, less than a half an ounce of marijuana. Still. Still. Wow, they haven't, they haven't. The Rockefeller drug laws, they still haven't dropped them. Wow. That's, that's. And so it's hard to hear. <laughs> and 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 again, when we talk about the Wackenhut situation, Bill Clinton came down with his ludicrous drug laws in order to make sure that his buddy George Wackenhut would be able to fill those prisons up when they opened up and they privatized the penal structure for a statistic. But in any event, here we are. Um, 
We seized the place. Uh, we negotiated very eloquently. We set up a coalition, and we, uh, some of us said, well, the hell with all these demands for reform. Some of us says we, uh, we want transportation to a non-imperialistic country immediately, mm-hmm. and uh, we want it uh, amnesty uh, from all criminal prosecution, right? And uh, we had 17 countries in the world said that they would take us. Really? Yes. So it was heard around the world because we were able to get the media on the inside, CBS, NBC, ABC, the, all the networks, mm-hmm. including New York Times and all the major news journalists. And for those that aren't aware, how long did this go on? This went on for five days, and then on the fifth day, after we had negotiated for five days and with observers uh-huh. like uh, William Kunstler, the famous radical attorney, civil rights attorney, um, uh, uh, Arthur O'Eve, assemblyman, John Dunn, Senator John Dunn, Clarence uh, um, uh, Jones from the Amsterdam News, um, a, a number of renowned people, Bobby Seale from the Black Panther parties came in during that time. A number of people came in as observers, Lewis, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and many others came in um, as observers. And uh, we tried to work out an agreement, but they would not agree to amnesty, the 29th demand. Mm-hmm. And so subsequently, Rockefeller, <clears throat> the governor of New York at that time, ordered the New York State troopers to go in and retake the prison. Mm-hmm. Now, what they did was on September 13th, 1971, they sent in over 1,000 state troopers, including guards that came in that weren't supposed to go into the prison with their own guns from their own homes to retake the prison. So you mean like trigger happy? Trigger happy. Oops. They were 1,000 of them up up on top of the rooftops in their uh, red rain, red uh, fluorescent raincoats. It was raining early that morning, September the 13th. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people don't know historically, on the same morning that this was going on, just before the invasion, the attack, um, there had been a standoff that was sort of inspired by what we were doing at Upper Attica, up at a place called Highway 81 in the Onondaga Indian Territory. Uh-huh. Now, Onondaga, the, the Mohawks were asked by Onondagas to come down. 800 armed Mohawks went there to stand in defense of Highway 81 to stop the expansion of Highway 81 by the New York State. When New York State was sending up the state troopers that morning to have an armed confrontation with the Mohawk warriors. <laughs> and they were halfway up there when they decided, well, New York the Rockefeller said, well, those Mohawks may give them a real serious run for their money. And so, in, and so what they did is decided to s- turn them back and send them in on us, unarmed men at Attica. I mean, all we had was sticks and clubs. So these guys were heading up, preparing to fight and shoot and do the whole Prepared thing. to kill Mohawks on Highway 81. And then they turned around and said, well, go over to Attica instead. And Ar- that's what unarmed happened. guys. Yeah. Now, when they came into the prison, wow. there was this the helicopter that flew up over, to, over, flew up over once they got the order. And it flew around five times. And as it was going around, there was a bullhorn that was saying, put your hands on top of your head, surrender to an officer, and you will not be harmed. And all of a sudden, they dropped the canisters of CN4 gas, which was banned for use for lethal, banned by the Geneva Convention in 1906 as ill, really lethal force, deadly force to be used as as a gas, as, as chemical warfare. Right, yeah. Literally. So they took these gas canisters and just saturated the yard. By that time, everybody was pretty much crawling. Right. And even though we were trying to defy them, you know, right to the bitter end, but then all of a sudden they launched over 25,000 rounds of bullets in less than five minutes. And I looked around, and as I was seeing, I was watching people just literally being shot to death and screaming and heads being just blown off. Wow. Gut spilling, testicles was blasted, uh. and when they seized the prison and come in with their gas masks, I felt three bullets hit me, wow. major grazes, and I was knocked off of a catwalk. Uh. I was on twenty five feet up on top of a catwalk, and I ran out right into a state trooper's gun. He pulled the trigger, and the clip fell out of the gun. Huh. I should have been dead at that moment, oh, yeah. and I thought I was dead. He, two other state troopers smashed me across the mouth, picked me up and threw me over, and threw me 20 feet, 25 feet down onto a handball court, and I went unconscious. Now, 
At the end of this assault, 43 people were killed. Mm. 80 people were wounded and maimed for life. And out of eventually... Many, out of how many prisoners? Out of uh, 1,300. 1,300. Uh-huh. And then 61 of us were eventually indicted for being ringleaders. <laughs> Of you, 61 prisoners. 61, 61 prisoners, no state troopers, no guards. There was a second grand jury that came down mm-hmm. to investigate the murders that were committed by New York state prisons, which they were getting. And there was a lot of testimony that was going on. Mm-hmm. Now, Nelson Rockefeller was uh, uh, attempting to be the governor of New York state, or he was attempting to be the vice president of the United States right. under Gerald Ford. Right, and I remember that. And during that time, he tried to, he, Nelson Rockefeller sequestered and had a head of the Bureau of uh, Criminal Investigation in New York, a guy by the name of Anthony B. Simonetti, he got him to suppress any evidence that would go before that second grand jury about the murders <laughs> that were committed by the state troopers in order to cover up so that he would, wouldn't look so bad during these Senate congressional hearings right. for his confirmation hearings as <laughs> vice president of the United States. Uh, well, there was a guy by the name of Malcolm Bell, who was one of an Attica prosecutor who basically wrote a 60 page report to the New York Times and told him that he would not be a part of that. And he blew the whistle on Rockefeller. Wow. That's a big time blowing the whistle. But now this was happening during the course of my trial Uh and Newsweek magazine had a picture of me and Bill Kunstler on the front of it. And in, in, you know, when I was convicted, uh-huh. But they quoted in their, mag- in their magazine, they said, unlike most murder trials, the trial of John uh, Dr. Hill was totally bereft of evidence. In other, in other words, there was no evidence. It was a, it was a, a sure enough scapegoat situation. And you, were, and you were taking the rap, yeah. And I took the whole rap, and I was the only one convicted for the whole Attica Rebellion. And the only way I didn't go to the electric chair and get killed for something I didn't do is that Rockefeller trying to cover his own tracks. And then when that, you see, when I was on trial, so you would have New a, York Times it's been a whole different story. Yeah. New York Times had that article, that 60 page article, but they held that article until the completion of my trial for two months. Oh, that stinks. You see, that really stinks. <laughs> okay. Now, I don't know who they were embedded with then. Right. Some, but it wasn't me. Right. You see? So, in other words, I was, it was a classic setup. I eventually became the only person convicted for the whole Attica Rebellion in 1971. Out of 61 of us indicted and out of hundreds of state troopers that were being possibly indicted for outright murders committed. Because, I mean, they stuck guns up people's rectums and blew out their balls. Horrible. Stuck it down their mouth. Man. They had brothers that were... St- thrown into pits that had feces and urine in it and but their hands behind their back and shot behind the head execution style wow wow well i really have to say it's it's quite an honor to have you in here and uh are you sure? Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> I'm making sure the door is unlocked still. But no, nah, it's easy. No, nah, it's easy. No, it really is and uh to to hear from somebody that was there, not only there but uh <laughs> Someone who went through it kind of like yourself, uh, having been the scapegoat and the whole thing. Well, it's really an honor to have you up here. We're getting towards the end of the show, and I just wanted to, um, now that we've talked a little bit about your experiences, Attica, I just kind of wanted to know what, what's going on today. What are you up to today, these days? Well, actually, I'm here to learn, too. Good. Uh, I, I I really enjoy learning, and I'm real excited about the Synergy Conference because uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, as indigenous people and people in general, Mm-hmm. Uh, given the current state of economic affairs in America, we better come up with some alternatives for our survival. Mm-hmm. Uh, I intend to give a fiery delivery on Saturday between 4 and 6 and, and at the LH1 or the Lecture Hall 1 mm-hmm. uh, and offer some indigenous perspective on some, some, some uh, initiatives I'm working with mm-hmm. in the communities I'm working with. I'm also going to be talking about... Uh, s- some armed confrontations I've been involved with up at Gustafson Lake and also Ginyonga in 1974 and about a host of other different things that will be talked about this weekend, mm-hmm. but also the ne- necessity to uh, to initiate prototypes and initiatives 
uh, for our, our self-sufficiency, whether it's growing agricultural gardens or doing mm-hmm. commercial hemp to create a, numer- a number of different products and create a gross national product for our survival. Uh, I'm here to learn. There's some really good uh, – there's a lot of great lectures that are going on, and, yeah. and, and, there's, and there's a lot of them going on at the same time. So you really – you have to – after you look at this, uh, at what's going on here, it's like, it's like wow, I'm just like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm like a rat in a cheese factory because <laughs> I have this inquisitiveness. I have sure. to learn, and I, I want to learn things that I'm really interested in. Survival and alternatives and sustainable alternatives is something that we all – all need to learn. So for all of you that are listening, mm-hmm. get on out and get over here and check out this Synergy Conference. Yes, please do. And in a lot of ways, that's where a lot of the activism from, it seems, from, from the times that we've been talking about tonight has kind of evolved into is learning how to live together sustainably and healing this earth and, and work doing this good work and continue it on. Well, it's been really great to have you as a guest here on Mo Medicine. And uh, We've been speaking with Dr. Jawia, and he's going to be uh, here at Evergreen State College at the Synergy Conference, which is the third annual Sustainable Living Conference. Lots of great speakers, like you heard him say, and uh, he'll be there on Thursday. I'm sorry, on Saturday night as a keynote speaker. And uh, if he was already, he was just starting to get fired up tonight. I mean, he was just barely starting. Tip of the iceberg. Yeah, so he's he's ready to tell you a whole lot more. And and it's it's what I like to say. It's real history. And it's recent history. You can't learn this stuff in your classroom in high school or even classroom at Evergreen. So if you want to learn some real recent history, some real things about life and and living life and and standing up and having a voice, well, come check him out. He's going to be speaking Saturday, 4 to 6, the Synergy Conference, and learn about what we all can do at this conference to uh, make a better future. Well, thanks for coming, and uh, hope to maybe get you on the phone sometime again. If not coming through town, we'll have you up here again. And uh, if you're still in town over the weekend, maybe we'll have you come on Gary's show. He comes; he has a show on Sunday, but you know, who knows? So, well, th- thanks for bringing me on, brother. It's been, it's been quite an honor. Well, it's been quite an honor once again to do a show tonight. And uh, coming up next, Free Things Are Cool with Eric Doc Hugger, as always, playing all kinds of indie music. And uh, I'll be back with you next week doing the same thing. I'm not sure if it's a full moon or not, but if not, who knows what's going to happen. I might have a guest. It'll be... A good show as well. So I got one more song queued up. It's A Simple Man by Burning Sky off their new release, self-titled A Simple Man.